Good. Okay. So, hello. I am here to talk to you about a, on, about a journey I've been on together with the company that I work for. I'm here to talk to you about YOLA, uh, the impossible story. Uh, better. Okay. We have to destroy his nice devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it better now? So this talk is um, the story about how we made a mobile operating system and a mobile phone and got them to market. And then I'll switch to a little more technical uh, part of the, the talk where I describe the kind of challenges of mobile devices and the software on them and a bit how we designed the UI on top. There's a bit of beep, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Okay. It's, the, it's the first talk of the day. La, 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 la. Okay, so take this thing very close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try this one instead. And it's on, it's on. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, something quickly about myself. Uh, my name is Carsten Monk. Uh, my role in the company is kind of to advise it on emerging technology matters. In practice, this means that I spend a lot of time investigating, researching, prototyping, and generally just hacking on things. Um, so, I have a master's degree from the University of Aarhus in Denmark on computer science, and I've been working on a small bunch of university research projects in pervasive computing topics uh, before joining YOLA. So, Something about Yola. We are a startup. We were created in 2011, and it's still possible to say you're a startup, even if we are three years old by now. We have 128 employees from 25 different countries. Uh, we have offices in two places, in Finland and one in Hong Kong, and a number of people distributed across the world. Um, it's best to think about Yola as a commercial open source project, because in practice we function as an open source project would, in terms of methods and ways that we're developing things, but we are distributed across the world and actually we are being paid to do what we are doing. Uh, our kind of main business is to make a mobile operating system for mobile devices called uh, Selfish OS, and we have two flagship devices, a phone and a tablet that is coming out um, later this year. So, to dive in a bit, um, what, about to t what I'm about to tell you is a story that hasn't been told very often, how the kind of YOLA, the company, came about. Um, we've always spoken about the qualities about our product, our user interface, but uh, our startup story is equally important. And there's a famous quote uh, quite often used in science based around the premise that one discovers by building on previous discoveries, uh, which is this, that if, if I have seen further, uh, it is by standing on the shoulders of, of giants. And when you're working in open source, this is very true as well, uh, Yola, the company, and Selfish OS, uh, the operating system, was both built on people, uh, communities, as much as it was built on code bases that pre-existed. And we wouldn't have been able to do um, what we did without this. So many fairy tales start with Once Upon a Time, and in this regard, the YOLA story starts with that too. Once upon a time, there was a company called Nokia, uh, which has very little uh, in common with the Nokia phone brand you know today in terms of open source engagement. They had made a, a device called the Nokia 770 in 2005, which was basically an internet tablet. It was able to connect to Wi-Fi, a Bluetooth to your phone, and had a full Linux system on it, uh, and came with a mobile user interface. In many regards, it was kind of a little bit ahead of its time, and uh, hacker community quite quickly built around it, which was this memo.org. Uh, with developers, with hardware and system hackers, uh, power users who came up with quite many uh, amazing ideas and concepts that they later, later on went on to commercialize in their own uh, small startup companies. Um, it was a quite productive community, which is, you can have a user community and then you can have a productive community where they're actually doing something together. Uh, a rather large one that were helping each other, uh, working together to achieve bigger goals. And this was also the community I was part of when I got interested in mobile Linux at first. It's a very friendly, happy community which made me able to basically start my own professional career in mobile Linux straight out of university. Um, there was one catch with Memo, 
which was the operating system, the internet tablets, and uh, later on phones like the Nokia N900 or Nokia 9, there was just an uh, operating system for Nokia devices, and it was obvious to many of us in the Memo.org community, including myself, that Memo had put more potential than just being just, just that. And one day, the Mego project arrived, and I still don't know who came up with the name. Um, it launched on the big fanfare. It was Intel and Nokia. Uh, that uh, launched their collaboration to merge their two operating systems, Intel's Moblin and Nokia's Memo uh, together, and at the same time expanding the use of the operating system beyond just mobile phones to tablets, to cars, to TVs. Um, and a new project was started, a merged code base was created, uh, millions upon millions of uh, euros uh, where it was poured into the project. And well, from an open source community point of view, this was what we had waited for. Um, a lot of good work to provide and create a, a solid mobile device core, where it happened basically making a modern uh, mobile OS. But everything doesn't go like in the fairy tales. Um, circumstances had on February 11th, 2011, Nokia announced a complete strategy change, uh, moving their smartphone strategy away from Mego to uh, Windows Phone, uh, another mobile operating system by a company you may know called Microsoft. Um, and a huge amount of very good uh, Linux embedded programmers, dev device maker experts, testers, designers, had their contracts terminated, and this decision also hit many of the companies in the open source ecosystem as well, because many of them had direct con uh, contracts with Nokia to work on these mobile operating system comp components. And well, Nokia was the major employer in Finland, and a substantial amount of uh, people in the, in the country had to find a new jobs or actually go out and create jobs. <clears throat> and the question for those of us who were now out in a job, what do we do next? Um, should we give up on our dreams of an open mobile platform, our hard work for the, almost the last 10 years, uh, change fields away from mobile, or um, give up because Microsoft won of all companies? Um, but the thing is that because we worked on open source software while we were working for Nokia, our efforts weren't actually lost. It was public, it was available, um, and we can continue working on it and use it in our own businesses and ideas because we had the expertise, we had the experience, we had the knowledge about the code base that other people didn't. So kind of rumors um, started flying around the community, ex-employees and the companies involved in Migo that there's something called YOLA, and we started grouping together in stealth, uh, having meetups to try and figure out what, what do we actually do? So, okay, we have these possibilities, what can we actually do? We started organizing investments together. Um, we needed money because, well, we didn't have a rich leader with endless amount of money or a huge pile of money generated from ad revenue. We had to go out and actually convince investors uh, that our ideas were viable and work very hard to do so. And we raised something along the lines of 40 million USD to do so. We got our initial funding, uh, mostly angel investments, coupled with uh, a bit of uh, government startup funding matching it. And this model kind of enabled us to maintain our independence, uh, do something we thought was right, um, compared to, for example, if we had to go with uh, venture capitalists. And such a thing is very important if you want to do something completely different and unique uh, that most people think is completely, utterly crazy. So we began a number of activities, um, finding hardware partners to create a flagship device, contacting mobile network providers, setting up retail channels for our devices, but we also began to prototype user interfaces. We had some of the best mobile UI designers of Nokia fame available to us uh, because, well, they no longer had a job uh, because everything was done in, uh, in uh, Seattle or Redmond now with Microsoft. And we started thinking, how can we do something truly unique and different? And so what you see here is a screenshot from early 2012, our home screen. And you'll quite soon see how our user interface evolved from that. But building software and making a product isn't about doing just that. Uh, you need to have a solid foundation. You need to have infrastructure. You need to have processes. You, have to have to, you need to have methods. And a large portion of our efforts uh, went into creating just that, so we could quite rapidly exp expand our efforts, our operations, and the company. Because a mobile device is not just about user interface, not just about code, but also about translation, variance, making, re making releases, having different configurations for different markets, test cases, which is surprisingly important as well. 
um, robots to test the UI uh, certification when you go into different markets. Does this actually el el electrocute people or does it not? Um, and so on. It's, it's, it's a huge operation that in many companies can take up to 2,000 people to do. And this is the number from a typical mobile operating system operation. And when we are 120 people in YOLA. At the same time, in a startup, uh, building culture is just as important as producing code because it helps each uh, employee, uh, it helps motivate each employee to do more. And we managed to build a company that had a very flat organization, a little bit like Valve, if you have been reading any, any about how they actually are working. Uh, extremely transparent company internally, open debate, but also we had like technical leads uh, to pull us, pull us forward to say this is the way we are going. Uh, based on expertise and knowledge, and it's it's a very interesting way of working in practice. Um, because, but at the same time, you get you get exposed to every single little facet of building and shipping a device, down to customer care, hiring, finances, investor relations. Um, of course, it's fantastic things to look, gain expertise and product creation knowledge. True, uh, but you also feel the bad things too. Some people might not like your product. You see it very firsthand. Uh, other people will be more demanding, saying we are not getting features fast enough. Uh, sometimes your money in the company almost runs out, and you have to make a fantastic demo to convince investors to invest more, etc., in just order to survive. Um, we also have a kind of different bonus system in the company. So we have a, s a simple bonus system where you get 100 euros each month, but the fact is that you have to give it away to somebody else in the company. Uh, this actually fosters collaboration and making sure that you try to kind of step outside your area to help others in the company sometimes and has been functioning quite well for us. So when we were finally ready to do so, we announced our existence in the press and uh, in on social media, which was kind of our primary platform for, for our startup. We got quite a lot of attention from the media and we managed to raise more money with investors that basically a group of highly expertised and experienced mobile professionals say they want to do something very special, a mobile device, a new mobile operating system. And many of us told, many had told us that what we were doing was completely impossible and it seemed completely crazy to many and many didn't believe we could actually pull it off, that we would be dead after half a year. But well, we managed to actually launch. Um, there's a very big uh, conference in Finland, which is called Slush, which is a kind of startup uh, uh, conference where there's a lot of uh, venture capitalists, investors, and startups coming there and presenting, where we launched our user interface in November 2012, where we launched this kind of very gestures based UI, very different from the kind of existing mobile devices, different from iOS, different from Android, different from uh, Windows Phone, uh, kind of built from the remains of the MIGA project with an exciting new experience on top. Um, and in the way in that we had a kind of very flat organization uh, at our launch, every single employee was on stage uh, at the launch event because what we were launching is it was not just the, event, uh, the effort of the founders of the company, it was the effort of everybody in the company and we were very proud of what we achieved. And as you can hear, we've been on quite a journey to get to where we are today and what, one of the results was that we produced a mobile device. Um, we didn't manufacture the device ourselves because nowadays most mobile devices are produced in anonymous factories in China or Taiwan. Uh, but what we did was combine together a beautiful industrial design, a hardware configuration, and mobile UI OS uh, to provide a great offering. And at the same time, just because we didn't uh, want to have enough challenges in the first place beyond just building a mobile device, we built a mobile operating system called Selfish OS, which is not Android based, uh, but is still able to run Android applications. And as you can see, it's pretty much a standard Linux stack. You can even have a terminal on the device if you want to. And using these technology enables from the stack you saw before, we build a, a beautiful UI as well. And these are the kind of screenshots of a, of a large amount of features from a mobile UI. And well, then we had to launch to consumers. So I'll just show you a quick uh, video of our first.
kind of took the challenge of um, we didn't have any TV ads, we didn't have any print media ads, we just went to social media, YouTube videos that you launch a device, and this was surprisingly effective as well. <laughs> this microphone doesn't like me. So when we had the kind of whole package done, we had made the operating system, we had made the user interface, we had made the hardware, and we spent special time on the first 300 devices that we were giving to our first consumers, checking thing, everything was fine with them, uh, and an additional quality insurance check, um, even adding small special thank you notes in each and every box. And we enlisted people from the entire, co entire company to do this and spent uh, two days in a very cold warehouse to do it, because um, this is a picture from a launch in, Helsing, in the middle of Helsinki in Finland, where we had invited our first 300 customers to come in the middle of winter of all times um, to receive their device. And despite the cold and wet weather, many people were really excited to get their devices. And we were happy too, because our first, the first part of our journey was complete. We did what many claimed to be impossible, building a device, a mobile operating system, and a mobile UI with just 120 people which is an operation of 2,000 people in many other companies, if they even manage to ship in the first place. But our journey didn't end with just doing that, so we have to pre-approve ourselves to be viable. Um, and, of course, you get a lot of feedback when you have a product out from your users, that you, and you might actually have to change your product a little bit as we went along. So in November last year, we launched um, uh, the Yola tablet, uh, which is Selfish OS 2.0, as we call it. Uh, we managed to get it crowdfunded, where we took a lot of, quite a lot of the feedback we have gotten both from product reviewers and our own users, and I kind of took a fresh review on the user experience. And in Barcelona, um, around February, March, there's a huge event called Mobile World Congress, uh, which is basically the event for mobile technology. And we got a huge amount of praise from uh, the media and analysts uh, for it and the new user experience. So I, I mentioned that we got the tablet uh, funded through a crowdfunding campaign. We managed to raise uh, 2.5 million USD, and we reached our initial crowdfunding goal in just one day. But um, doing a successful crowdfunding campaign is really hard to do. Uh, we kind of had the advantage uh, that we all had already managed to put out a product without actually raising crowdfunding money, which meant that we, we knew what we were doing. And some of you may might be in startups where you have no idea what kind of cost you will actually be having in hardware or what kind of problems that can occur making hardware. That can be everything from a total showstopper that, that when you apply a, a very heavy static electricity to your, to your device that it explodes or stops working and then you can't actually ship it to Europe, for example. So making hardware is actually surprisingly hard. Um, but in practice, what matters is the kind of amount of founders you get not necessarily the amount of money, um, because when you go out to investors, the amount of believers or amount of potential users you have is actually what helps getting you a proper valuation in many places. And it's also important to have other investors to back you up, because crowdfunding money is not necessarily going to be enough for doing your campaign. Um, the important thing is also that we learned quite quickly that we have to all outsource when we can, because you, you can't do everything yourself. Um, you can't have every single talent for building a, 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 a device or a hardware in-house, and you need to have a, um, one core activity of your company or your project, which you're basically good at, and ours was to build a mobile operating system. So, what's next for Sailfish OS? So, of course, we, are sh at the moment, this is crowdfunded tablet, so we're shipping it to our backers. Uh, but we also have a roadmap to uh, open source our Sailfish user, user experience. Um, so, just a quick show of hands. Does anyone know of Yola before this talk? Okay, good. So, um, there has been a, a, some news articles recently about Yola where we have been talking about working with the BRICS countries, as in Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China and South Africa, uh, countries and kind of companies within, within them to give them technological independence. And that's, well, those countries cover 40% of the world's population. And technolo technological independence in the Snowden age is something that matters surprisingly a lot. Um, and something I think that we should be thinking about quite a lot here in the EU as well. So uh, these are some of the headlines we've been getting recently, for example, uh, the kind of unusual situation that the Russian communication minister has been backing up around Sailfish OS. Um, but what we're not, we not trying to do like um, 
um, a national operating system for each of these countries, because um, we are aiming for having investors from my international portfolio of, uh, to kind of ensure that we are an independent operating system company. Um, and instead, it will be one code line where we have different services from different, for, different company, for, for different countries on top, for example. In Russia, it would be quite typical to, for example, have Yandex, which is the kind of the Google of Russia. Or in India, it would be Snapdeal or uh, Times Internet, etc. Uh, on top of the devices. But the thing is also that um, to show that you have a mobile, viable mobile platform, you need to create a ship a mobile device because your, your, your platform is nothing worth unless you have actually proven with, an, with operators, as in mobile networks, uh, or retail challenges, channels, or customers, that this device works, it can pass certification, it's stable, it's something you can actually rely on as a, as a phone. And this is something many other emerging operating systems have not gotten to this point. Um, we have also gathered, encountered quite great interest from, in Sailfish OS from many different companies, uh, big and small, because uh, in practice they believe that uh, they and many other companies are being locked out of mobile commerce by Google and Apple, because, and it's not good uh, for competition and innovation that there's basically a monopoly in mobile, or duopoly in mobile in operating systems. And the question is, do we want the future of computing and mobile commerce ruled by two, two companies? So, now for something a little more technical. So, I have no idea what kind of backgrounds all of you are, so I'm just going for a bit of the basic challenges you have on a mobile device. Um, so these are the kind of the specs of a mobile, uh, yellow mobile phone versus this MacBook Air that I have, that I'm presenting from right now. And as you can see, there's kind of diff many different, uh, significant differences in, and constraints in a mobile device, including a completely different expectancy of battery life from the user. You will have slower storage, you'll have slower RAM, you'll have probably a, a hell, of, hell of a lot less CPU cache. And I'm showing you this to kind of give you a bit of understanding of the kind of problems you'll be having making a mobile OS, or for that matter, anything interactive that runs on a battery. And as, as we're kind of emerging into user expectations of our devices, um, e even the industrial ones, that they, they, they kind of expect that you, their experience has to be interactive and iPhone-like. And this has started hitting every field from, from everything from medical to bus stop designers of devices. So, first off, the CPUs of a mobile device. This is ARM Cortex A9, a typical um, processor architecture from one of some of the more low end for mobile phones today and the kind of states it can be in. Of course, you can have multiple cores of a processor that has independent states. And kind of let's start from the bottom of, of power consumption. Of course, when the CPU is, is shut down, of course, well, it doesn't use terribly much of, of power at that point. Uh, dormant, the CPU is off, but the RAM is kept alive, as in the state is, is kept. So we can technically start it up and have the same, same state as we were before in the device. Stand by that the CPU is powered, but it doesn't process any instructions. But, for example, if a signal comes in, for example, VLAN, the modem is receiving some data, a timer, um, the alarm wants to wake up the device to show that, well, now you actually have to wake up. Um, then, of course, the CPU would start uh, running again. Uh, in addition to that, a CPU can run in kind of different frequencies and dynamically scale based on, on, on the workload. Uh, but, of course, this comes at a cost because it may take a higher power consumption and generate more heat. And more heat is not always pleasant when you have a mobile device in your pocket. But... In a mobile device, there's all things consuming power. A uh, GPU can run at completely different frequencies as well. And using a GPU to its full extent uh, can make a major difference in power consumption. A display, depending on the time, uh, on, on type can take more power when you try to update it. For example, an EX, EX screen, uh, an AMOLED, for example, that when you actually send a new frame to the display to be shown, it may might take it more, more than keeping the display stable. Um, the backlight of a screen it can, in practice, be multiple LEDs lighting up the screen based on uh, what kind of image it's showing on the screen um, in order to get the best picture 
in the, in the kind of environment. And of course, having a 3D or 4G modem can be very power consuming, the most when it's kind of uh, transmitting data. And of course, it's the same for Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Scanning for networks or devices can actually be extremely power consuming. Having a GPS open, flashing LEDs, albeit this is one of the more low cost costs. And the flash on a camera can take amazingly amount, uh, high amounts of power when you're trying to take a picture. And of course, keeping different sensors awake, like axle meter, compass, and so on. But what does this mean in practice? So these have kind of uh, implications about how your mobile operating system um, for mobile will be designed. It means you can't just go ahead and have a timer going uh, and activating every five seconds, because that's going to be uh, draining the battery of the device quite quickly. You need to have discipline. You need to have smart code. Um, because otherwise it'll run down your battery and, well, then you'll have an Apple Watch instead that runs out after four hours. Um, you also have to take CPU frequency scaling into account. Sometimes it's better to get your CPU to run for high frequency for less time than keeping a low frequency for longer time um, because it can finish the workload quicker and just go back to sleep. Um, Communication is the bigger, one of the bigger power consumers on the device, as I said, as I said before, that you have to use it intelligently. Uh, you, ha you shouldn't just go out and pull on the network all the time. You should have data pushed to you instead, because that means that you can have the device mostly asleep, and then it wakes up when some of the data comes in over 3G. Um, a small trigger is also to, for example, disable the screen when it's not needed. Uh, for example, when the device is laying up, uh, upside down on the table, or when you're on a call and it's against your cheek, it doesn't make sense that the display is on. And even um, adjusting the backlight to kind of give the best uh, picture on the surroundings uh, means that you're going to end up having better power consumption in regular light scenarios. Um, and also, it might seem very tempting when you're making an embedded or mobile device to just put your standard favorite uh, Linux distribution on mobile, but trust me, they're not made with battery or power restrictions in mind. In addition to that, uh, you have a lot less memory uh, on these devices, but some key, key essentials. You have to kind of slim down your system. Um, you shouldn't assume that you have infinite amount of memory uh, to, for example, swap, as in putting swap on, uh, on a virtual memory on, a, on an SD card, because it's quite easy to end up in a kind of trashing scenario where you can't free memory enough uh, by pushing into mass storage uh, fast enough to have uh, still feel like your device is interactive. In addition to that, something that m most people overlook is that graphics buffers actually take up surprisingly large am amounts of memory because they are shared between uh, the GPU and the CPU in, the, in, uh, in RAM on most devices. On a full HD display that many phones have nowadays, uh, one single screen uh, full buffer is eight megabytes of size. And usually these applications are then triple buffers towards a composite or something like adding up to 24 megabytes of use of each application. Um, so it quite, quite quickly adds up if you're doing anything, anything like uh, trying to show many different applications running at the same time, etc. In, in addition to that, you have to kind of have a proper application life cycle. For example, that you have to suspend your, your in foreground, your in background. The, de the application is shut down because it kind of helps quite a lot on the memory management. And um, if you're using Linux, um, you have to compile your code to, for example, position independent code and kind of reduce the amount of relocations, as in make sure that the code is actually the same across many different li um, uh, processes. Um, and importantly, that you try to, don't try to load the kitchen sink of libraries into your process, because loading and initializing libraries cost precious application startup time. You don't want your application to take five seconds to start up. It should be closer to something like maybe half a second or less. An example that I've kind of seen of kind of misunderstanding the environment, so um, one company uh, took the KDE desktop environment and put it on a, a fairly hefty mobile device, and still it took 30 minutes to boot up. So this is why this is important. Now, something a little more nasty, um, something about how you deliver graphical feedback to user. So a few facts of life. A typical mobile display will update at 60 frames per second. 
And what does this actually mean in practice? It means that you have a budget of less than 16.67 milliseconds to render whatever you want to show next on the screen. And that's not a terribly lot. And if you don't manage this particular deadline, it means that your feedback is not smooth. And if you mean miss a frame, the latency between when a user touches the screen and your system reacts increases. And this is something that, you, uh, that, uh, that people basically can pick up quite easily. In addition to that, on devices, as I said, you have slow RAM, your bandwidth constraint in practice. Let's assume you have a perfect GPU that takes no more time than just the memory bandwidth, um, and you want to blend two full HD uh, graphical buffers together of eight megabyte size to one full HD uh, buffer, let's say, mix two pictures together. Um, it will take 2.8 millisecond, and this is a relatively simple operation in GPU rendering. And now imagine you're on a 4K resolution display, uh, which means it takes four times as long, and you end up having only four milliseconds to do kind of general computation to prepare the rendering of the frame. So it's a, it's a surprisingly nasty environment to be in. But because of these kind of constraints, I can't recommend anybody to try to build their own UI framework from scratch for mobile, even though it may seem, seem tempting, it seems like a nice challenge. But if you're not in the business of making UI frameworks, you shouldn't do it. You should take an existing one that has been optimized for mobile already, is stable, and we ended up using Qt, which some of you might know, which is a very fa fairly well-known UI um, framework, even embedded. Um, but also, before you actually go ahead and write a mobile UI and mobile application of anything, for example, for a medical device, you should work with your designers and work quite closely with them because otherwise you're going to have a bad experience and that's also quite bad in terms of uh, having your users be happy. So this is a kind of example of how we work together um, between developers and designers in Yola. So instead of having like a separate de design uh, um, department that works in the ivory tower somewhere in the company and just sends out sh sheets and sheets of uh, UI specifications, we have a, a common understanding of how the user interface should really look. So we don't have a thousand page of how UI should work. We should just, we actually go ahead and just show how it works. So these we distribute and comment on by UI coders and designers like sitting very closely together, commenting on the many different screens of the entire OS together, and where it outlines the functionality, the design, and in the end, a designer just goes ahead and blesses the implementation, as in now it matches the vision of the designer. Just pure UI experience constantly iterated. <clears throat> but you also have to remember that not only your, de uh, you, you, your design is not only going to involve your designers and your UI coders, but you actually need to work with your target users, not just listen to them, but make them a kind of active participants in your design process. And um, one method um, is participatory design, which I kind of recommend you to read up on, um, where it quite often ends up uh, uh, up yielding a much better product and kind of uh, prevent some of the typical governmental disasters in IT products where users end up not liking or even remotely want to use your product. And the, the term kind of participatory design is used in a, a very variety of fields like urban design, architecture, landscape architect, um, architecture, because it's a way of creating environments that are more responsive and appropriate to your, the inhabitants and users' different cultural emotional or practical needs. And I think this is where I wrap up. So what I've been showing you so far is just a snapshot of the kind of issues and surrounding mobile and the kind of story about Yola. But in practice, I'm standing here with a large amount of, I would say, quite up-to-date knowledge about the, a lot of things, about everything mobile. And if I had to, I could fill four hours with slides and stories from the battlefield. So maybe it's, it's worth asking, what would you like to know about mobile? What kind of problems do you have in mobile? Uh, what areas you might want insight in, in the remainder of this time? Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions? Otherwise, I'll start with a question. Um, the choice of Qt. Uh, 
uh, the, the Viking strike again. Have you been happy with that? And does it cost license fees? Um, yeah, so, so Qt is, is what we call triple licensed. So it comes either under uh, LGPL, which is a triple open source license, GPL, or under a commercial license. We have been able to use it with the, the open source license ourselves. It doesn't stop us. Um, so a common misunderstanding about Qt is that um, the moment you want to make anything commercial with it, then you have to get a commercial license. But in practice, if you want to make something commercial, you can just use the LGPL version typically, unless you are in certain environments where you have to abide to license con uh, limitations. Um, can you just say something about some key figures of your business model? I mean, how does it work? How, how can you sell? Which countries do you sell? How is, that, how is it ramping up the business? Of course, it, it, it's, it's always a little difficult to um, get into the device business because it's a pretty saturated market at this point. But the fact is that, uh, as I was also saying in uh, part of my talk, that many companies are feeling like they're being locked out of mobile commerce. So it's quite often that we are positioning our mobile operating system together with a hardware partner and then these different, for example, different service providers. So, for example, even having a business model of getting a cut of the transactions going in mobile commerce to the device is actually a sufficient enough business model to uh, keep a mobile or any system going, especially with just 120 people. So this is kind of where we're aiming at, that the mobile or any system and working together with partners and making sure there's competition is our business model. So we, I can't say how many devices we sold because it's also been about validating our mobile operating system with users, but we have a quite solid uh, amount of happy users that are contributing, commenting about our features, etc. if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, in the end, we saw you mentioned that you have multitasking, and does this really mean that we can have two apps at the same time on the screen, or? Yes, uh, so, so it, it doesn't mean like, um, if you have been watching an Apple keynote recently, it doesn't mean the split screen because we are still implementing mm. that. But the applications are factually running at the same time. It's a basic Linux system. Uh, we have this kind of different, either you're full screen or you're in a cover, as in this kind of small one. So when you're in a cover, of course, you use a little less resources because you're not trying to render to an entire full screen. But you can still interact with the application. You can still wake up. You can still uh, activate if you need to. So it is real multitasking like you know from a PC. Okay, and second question is, um, you mentioned that you can really have the console in the device. Yes. For typing. And Clemens was very happy to hear that. And what kind of uh, customers did you have in mind when you started uh, designing the phone? So is it some special customers or everybody? So, so our original story was actually to go to uh, the Chinese market in, in Italy because they're very much about uh, personali personalizable devices because you need to stand out in practice. So, for example, we have these kind of exchangeable back covers on the device. It's very much about that your UI looks very different, very custom to you. So that was the original idea of the operating system. So it's not meant as a geek device. It's not like a new free one when you have been running with it for a while that you want to throw it over your balcony and never touch it again. It's meant for regular consumers and kind of evolving the, top, the, the system over time. All right, thank you. Hi. <clears throat> yes, so I uh, have one question. And actually, before I go to my question, I want to thank you for doing Selfie Show as I've been part of the Memo community before. Mm -hmm. I'm still rocking my N900, so I'm very happy that you guys are continuing to build these devices. Uh, one feature I found missing from the slides was the other half, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say what the plans are regarding that feature, because that was something that I was very excited about. Yeah, so, so, so um, we, we haven't been we're doing, to, so just to summarize for everybody else, we have this concept of the other half. Just, I guess. You can take the back cover of the device, and this is uh, power in and out. Uh, NFC and I square C connectors. So you actually end up having an uh, intelligent back cover. You can put an e ink screen, you can put a solar charger, or anything you want on it. So, but in practice, it has, uh, it has ended up a little bit more like that we, as a company, have been sold in kind of content back covers just together with Rovio Angry Birds. 
Uh, but then our community has, for example, been doing things like uh, putting a keyboard as an extension for the device, um, solar chargers, whatever you can come up with. Even some even have a dip switch on the back to switch between modes on the device. Um, so the, the, the other half thing, it, it's, it's a bit up in the air how it's going to look because maybe now that we have proven that we have a mobile device and a tablet, then the next step is to promote the operating system. So likely it's also that the next device is not necessarily going to be a YOLA brand device, but uh, one of our partners' brands instead. Uh, but I can't give you a definitive answer if like, the other half concept is dead or if it's not because it might show up in some different configurations of devices in the future, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned that uh, Telfish OS can actually run Android applications, mm -hmm. and uh, that sounds complex in terms of uh, what you have to do to be actually compatible with it. Um, can you comment on that? Um, so your question was if uh, y that I mentioned that uh, the device can run Android applications, and it sounds complicated. Yeah, from the development point of view, when developing um, the operating not really, system. Not really, not um, really. So, of course, we have a native application story, but I think it's fair to say that to catch up with um, the APIs and features of, uh, let's say, an Android platform, from, from a developer point of view, uh, to a native application story takes time. And at the same time, having a static application story that people can actually use develop the platform, the services, like for example with Android, it means that we are more flexible on making a native application side, because the conditions of application making back when Android was designed, and today, where we have a lot more connected devices, we have 4G and so on, um, <clears throat> it, um, it uh, enables us to try and make an application API that matches with the reality of today, and not when Android was made. So. The results of this kind of strategy that we haven't developed our native application story that much will start appearing when you're looking at, for example, the whole emergence of smartwatches, smart TVs, IVI, in-vehicle infotainment, because you need to start taking those environments into account. And if you're looking at, for example, the Android Watch, there's, it's not working that terribly good in terms of applications, or even that uh, Apple is talking about that they have three different ecosystems. In terms of users, you can install, install a typical Android application store and the application will just work. In terms of a, a developer, you can uh, then also install your APKs or Android applications straight on the device, so it's not really complicated. Um, we have a pretty good Android runtime on the device as one of the only companies in the, the industry. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, do you use a different permissions model for your native applications, or is it all the uh, Android um, security model? Uh, so, so it, 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 we have a different um, permissions model in practice. So on Android, it, it works best if you're applying the permissions model of Android permissions, because otherwise it's going to be a nightmare for developers. But over time, we're going to end up uh, sandboxing the applications a lot more. Um, and having a different way of having security permissions because it's also clear that uh, Android permissions is not working in the environment we have today because anyway, people just end up clicking accept to any permissions you want to give to the device. And when there's a fantastic research paper stating, for example, that you can pick up speech with uh, the gyroscope access of your application, then I think we need to start taking a little more consideration about what kind of permissions we give applications on devices. More questions? Can I cast one? <laughs> okay. So, so what about security? You mentioned the post Snowden age. So, obviously, you might have a platform where people have a different level of security. So, there's no intrinsic tracking software from the NSA. It sounds a little. Yeah. Or is this a market for you, or is it just um, uh, remote? Yes. Yeah, so, you're talking about uh, secure phone environments, right? Yeah. So, so we have. Earlier this year, we were launching a collaboration together with SSH a company, 
which is a typical VPN or governmental security provider as well, uh, which is called Selfish Secure, which is kind of an initiative to bring uh, the YOLO operating system uh, or self Selfish operating system to the secure phone areas as well. Because, well, as I said, that in this uh, Snowden age, that uh, privacy and technological independence is suddenly starting to be quite Im uh, important to many governments, especially here in Germany, I hear. So this is a story that develops over time, but these things, since they involve governments, it's going to take several years. Anything else? But otherwise, uh, you're always welcome to, to bother me uh, between the breaks, or if you want to see a demo of the device as well. So you developed this phone and the operating system, and I'm wondering how tightly coupled those two are. Like, could I just take my Android phone and install Jolla in it, or could yes, I? Yeah, yeah. So the, the question was if uh, how tightly coupled uh, the operating system is to the hardware. So um, one of the key mistakes in Nokia and Miko was the fact that they built one operating system per device, which is not very sustainable strategy. Um, and uh, we, we kind of took that into learning. So the operating system you're seeing on here is exactly the same code as is running on here. We have uh, it running on Nexus 5, Nexus 4, a couple of Samsung phones. So we are quite independent. Uh, even our emulator in our SDK is, is basically the whole, whole operating system, but with a virtual box um, hardware adaptation. So we try to be very flexible in this regard. Because if you can't scale your operating system, then you're not going to get any customers either. Okay. okay. One last question, I guess. Thanks. Um, how did you approach the question of how to write a UI? I mean, from a personal point of view, I've never used Yola before, but um, every mobile UI I've ever had at my fingertips was, from my point of view, utterly horrendous to use. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a similar experience? Did, you, did other users say, OK, we need something that is different from what we have on the market now, or did you try more like to uh, relate to what's, what iOS does or what Android does? Um, that, that, that's kind of um, a thing that I usually say around user interfaces in mobile, and that is, uh, so I don't know if anybody watched South Park, there's an episode called Simpsons already did it. And this, this is very true of mobile as well, that in practice everybody has done all the features that you're seeing in product nowadays. What Selfish OS is the manifestation of five to seven years of thought of designers uh, from Nokia taking, okay, so what could we actually do better if we had the chance? And I feel personally that I'm having difficulties to go back to, back to an Android device after using this for a while because it just feels more it feels more like a limb to me, like a part of my body in practice, because it's quick interactions. I go in, I tap, write a message, put it back down again, and then I can continue doing whatever I was doing with my life. So um, actually developing the UI is done by with a language called QML, which is basically a mix of uh, JavaScript and JSON, and it's extremely easy to make beautiful UIs with that. So. It, said it, it, was a, it was a language made so designers could make uh, functional UI prototypes quite easily as well. So it enables us to, to uh, develop this in record time and increasingly uh, add new features quite easily, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you very much for these insights. and. Uh...